Hi learners, it's M from Sano Nerds, and this video is on Unit 19, Doppler Physics and Instrumentation. Unit 19, Doppler Physics and Instrumentation. So outside of ultrasound, most of us have experienced a Doppler shift. If you have ever heard an emergency vehicle with their siren active, you may have noticed that the pitch of the siren has changed in regards to the vehicle's location and you. Now learning about Doppler as it applies to ultrasound doesn't need to alarm you. We're going to break this down into sections. Unit 19 is going to be a little bit more of the math and the physics behind Doppler, and then Unit 20 will be more of the clinical application of Doppler. In Unit 19, we're going to cover the Doppler effect, Doppler shift, the Doppler equation, continuous wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, color Doppler, and the instrumentation. Now the pitch getting higher as the vehicle comes towards you and then sounding lower as it drives away is called the Doppler effect. Section 19.1 Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is the change in frequency and wavelength that is caused by the motion of one of three things, either the sound source, receiver, or the reflector. So let's use a siren on a moving vehicle as our example. Say we have a fire truck. And the fire truck siren produces a sound with a frequency of 800 hertz. If the truck is stationary, you are going to perceive the siren sound to also be 800 hertz. You are receiving those wavelengths, you're receiving that frequency as it is coming out of the siren in the stationary position. Note that the wavelengths are equal and true to the 800 hertz. If the truck is moving towards you, that siren is still producing a frequency of 800 hertz. But as the truck moves towards you, the particles are going to begin to oscillate faster, creating shorter wavelengths, which increases the frequency that you hear. So you perceive the siren sound to be 820 hertz. So again, frequency of the siren has not changed, but the fact that it's moving towards you changes how the particles are interacting with one another, thus increasing the frequency that you can hear. Looking at our video here, notice how the sound waves are being compressed faster, which are going to cause shorter wavelengths. And remember, short wavelengths equal higher frequency. As the truck drives past us, Remember, the siren is still at 800 hertz. It has not changed, but what we perceive will change. So as the truck is moving away from us, the particles are gonna be oscillating slower behind it. That's going to create longer wavelengths, which decreases the frequency that we hear. So now we might perceive the sound to be at 780 hertz. So again, those sound waves are being stretched out a little bit more. That causes longer wavelengths, and long wavelengths go with lower frequency. So in this example, the Doppler effect is the physical phenomenon that the sound pitch changed as the sound source moved due to the frequency and wavelength changes being perceived by the receiver. So in short, a sound source or reflector moving towards the receiver causes short wavelengths, which is a higher frequency, and higher frequencies sound as higher pitches. When the sound source or reflector is moving away from the receiver, it's going to cause longer wavelengths, which cause lower frequencies and are perceived as lower pitches. The change in frequency due to motion is the Doppler shift. Section 19.2, Doppler shift. Again, the change in frequency due to motion is the Doppler shift. And the Doppler shift can be calculated by taking the received frequency and subtracting the transmitted frequency. So here we have our first equation. This is a very basic equation and this is essentially what the machine is using. It is going to know what frequency it is sending out. So that's frequency T, frequency transmitted and then it's going to know what frequency it received. That's frequency R. So frequency received minus frequency transmitted gives us our Doppler shift. 
So let's use our fire truck again. Now the transmitted frequency of the siren is 800 hertz. And when we're stationary, the received frequency is 800 hertz. There is no motion, therefore there's no Doppler shift. So 800 hertz is the received minus 800 hertz, the transmitted, equals 0 hertz. And again, there's no change because there is no motion. We are not experiencing a Doppler shift. Recall though, when the truck was moving towards you, we were hearing higher pitches because of shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies. So now we are receiving a frequency of 820 hertz. So 820 hertz, frequency received, minus the 800 hertz, frequency transmitted, equals 20 hertz. 20 hertz is the Doppler shift. And when the fire truck is driving away from you, as a receiver, you're receiving a lower frequency, 780 hertz. So 780 hertz, the frequency received, minus the 800 hertz frequency transmitted equals a negative 20 hertz. Negative 20 hertz is the Doppler shift. So I hope you noticed that when the received frequency was greater than the transmitted, we got a positive Doppler shift. And when the received frequency was less than the transmitted, we got a negative Doppler shift. So again, positive Doppler shifts are going to occur when the object is moving towards the receiver, and that makes the received frequency greater than the transmitted. Negative Doppler shifts are going to occur when the object is moving away from the receiver, and the received frequency is less than what was transmitted. A Doppler shift can be detected by our machines when it evaluates the frequency of the echoes being returned off of the moving reflectors, which happen to be our red blood cells. So when the red blood cells are moving towards the transducer location, they will reflect back higher frequencies than what the transducer is producing. And when the red blood cells are moving away from the transducer location, they will reflect back lower frequencies than what the transducer is producing. The red blood cells that are moving towards the transducer produce a positive shift, or the red blood cells moving away from the transducer produce a negative Doppler shift. So let's take a look at an example of how a Doppler shift might look using ultrasound values. Remember the Doppler shift is calculated. So its Doppler shift is going to be equal to the frequency received minus the frequency transmitted. So let's say we're using a 5 megahertz transducer. Remember this is the same as 5 million hertz. The transducer is going to transmit a frequency of 5 million hertz into the body. That sound wave is going to strike a red blood cell. And that red blood cell is going to send an echo at a certain frequency back to the transducer. In our example, we can see that the red blood cells are moving towards the transducer location. So these red blood cells are reflecting back a greater frequency to the transducer. In this example, I've selected 5 million 3,000 hertz. So to plug that into our equation then, we'll have the received frequency of 5 million 3,000 hertz minus the transmitted frequency of 5 million hertz, and what we get is a Doppler shift of 3,000 hertz. Now that, remember, the red blood cells are traveling towards the transducer, their received frequency is greater, so we are seeing a positive Doppler shift of 3000 hertz. Let's take a look then of how it might look when the red blood cells are moving away from the transducer. Again, we still have our 5 megahertz transducer transmitting a 5 million hertz sound beam. As that sound beam interacts with the red blood cells, they are going to send an echo back less than the transmitted because they are moving away from the transducer. So in this example, I've selected 4,997,000 hertz. Plugging those numbers into our equation, we have the received frequency of 4,997 hertz minus our transmitted frequency of 5 million hertz, and that gives us a Doppler shift of negative 3,000 hertz. So again, we are seeing the reflector moving away from the receiver, so we are going to see a negative shift. And in this example, we get a negative shift of 3000 hertz. Now the machine is going to receive these reflected frequencies along with a lot of other frequencies. 
when Doppler instrumentation is being used, the machine is going to use the demodulator to demodulate or identify those very small frequency shifts and extract them from the high ultrasound frequencies for further processing. Now, before we move on to the actual Doppler equation, I do want to cover some very key facts that you need to know about Doppler shifts and their relationship to ultrasound. First, the Doppler shift is a shift in frequencies. This is not a change in amplitude, intensity, or speed. It is the frequency that the red blood cells are returning back to the transducer. Since Doppler shift is a frequency, the unit for Doppler shift is going to be hertz. Sometimes you will also see it in kilohertz. In ultrasound, the Doppler shifts we can detect range between 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. They also will range from negative 20 hertz to negative 20,000 hertz, depending on the direction of the reflector. Since ultrasound Doppler shifts range between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, this makes the Doppler shift audible. So if you have your volume on, and you should, when you're performing Doppler ultrasound, the sound that you can hear is actually the Doppler shift. And lastly, the Doppler shift is what is detected and calculated by the machine using a relatively complex formula. But the Doppler shift is not what we are interested in. It's not the diagnostic part of performing Doppler ultrasound. What we really want are the velocities. So by rearranging the formula and performing calculations, the machine will display the velocity of the blood in the area being interrogated. Section 19.3, Doppler equation. Now I've already seen this Doppler shift equation. It is a very basic equation, again, subtracting the transmitted frequency from the received frequency. The machine is actually very good at this equation because it knows what frequency it is sent out and it understands what frequency it is receiving back. But the machine being able to recognize Doppler shift is not very helpful for the diagnostic value from performing Doppler ultrasound. So the machine takes the Doppler shift value and then can calculate the velocity of the blood moving through the sampled area. So that makes the velocity of the blood much more important to sonographers. The problem is though is that this equation does not account for velocity of blood. So we need to know the Doppler equation so we can rearrange it to solve for velocity. So in its very expanded form, here is the Doppler equation. We have the frequency of the Doppler shift is going to be equal to 2 multiplied by the transmitted or operating frequency multiplied by the velocity of the blood multiplied by cosine of theta all divided by propagation speed. In a little bit more of a shortened form, I have the abbreviations for all of our variables along with the units that are needed for this formula and then even shorter without the units. You absolutely need to know the Doppler equation. You have to know that it's the frequency of the Doppler shift is going to be equal to 2 multiplied by the operating frequency multiplied by velocity multiplied by the cosine of theta all divided by propagation speed. So I do encourage you to start with a little bit more shortened form so you know what the components of the Doppler equation are and how they are related. You're never going to be asked to do the actual math or do calculations with the Doppler formula, but you will need to know how to rearrange this to solve for velocity and you'll need to know the relationships that exist within the formula. I will be showing you some examples of the math so you can see how those relationships change when we change other variables. So it's going to be very important to also understand the units that are used in the formula as well. Every variable in the formula is important to understand what it means to the formula. So let's go step by step through each variable and talk a little bit more about what it means and its implication on the Doppler equation formula. Now the whole purpose of this equation is to allow us to calculate the Doppler shift, and we're going to need to know all the variables to be able to do this. But remember the machine is already able to determine the Doppler shift based on received and transmitted frequencies as determined by the demodulator. So we'll see later how already knowing the Doppler shift is going to be calculated into velocity measurements. But for now remember again that Doppler shift is calculated based on these variables and it is the change in frequencies because of moving objects. The 2 in the equation 
is a constant, and that is always going to be there. You must have that two in there. And that two represents the fact that there will be a Doppler shift when the transmitted beam strikes the red blood cell, and then another Doppler shift when the red blood cell reflects the sound. The operating frequency is also known as the transmitted frequency, and that's the sound that is produced by the ultrasound transducer. So if you are working with a 5 MHz transducer, that is the operating frequency. Now you really need to pay attention to units. In this example, we have the operating frequency needing to be expressed in kilohertz. So again, if we're using that 5 MHz transducer and we want to plug numbers into our formula, we're actually using a 5000 kilohertz transducer. And that is calculated by converting 5 MHz to 5000 kilohertz. This is another variable that the machine knows and is determined by the machine as well. Now I've already mentioned that for the Doppler equation, velocity needs to be a known variable. However, that's really not the case in ultrasound. Remember, the machine knows the Doppler shift, it doesn't know the velocity. So later we are going to see how to rearrange this formula to solve for velocity. But in the meantime, let's look a little bit closer at what velocity actually is. Velocity is the speed and direction of a moving object. The key part here is that it's speed and a direction, where speed is just distance divided by time. So if, again, if you think of driving on the highway, miles per hour, kilometers per hour, that is your speed. You have to add a direction into that to create a velocity. So in ultrasound, we often look at speed in the units of centimeters per second, or possibly meters per second. And to translate this into a velocity, we need to know a direction. And so for ultrasound, our directions are as simple as towards the transducer, which is that positive shift, or away from the transducer, which is the negative shift. However, velocity is calculated by knowing the angle of flow in relation to the sound beam. So that direction comes from knowing how the sound beam and the flow are related to one another. So again, very important, velocity is speed and direction, where speed is distance divided by time. At the end of velocity, I mentioned that we have to know a direction, and the direction is calculated by knowing the angle of flow in relation to the sound beam. So this is really where the cosine of theta is going to apply. So to accurately calculate the Doppler shift and velocity, that angle of flow to the scan line must be known. So we can kind of think of the cosine of theta as a modifier for the velocity. It is going to tell us if flow is away or towards the transducer, which is negative or positive. This is also important to know is because if the sound beam is anything other than parallel, only a fraction of the Doppler shift will be reported, or a falsely elevated velocity will be reported. So I know that was probably a lot to take in right now. Let's look at some examples of what that angle means and then what cosine of the angle means. So when you see that symbol, it's the kind of a capital O with a line through the middle of it, that is the Greek letter theta. And when you see that symbol, that usually represents that an angle is present. In ultrasound, the angle is going to be between the direction of flow and the direction of the sound beam. So in our example here, we have the transducer producing a sound beam, and it is entering into the body in this direction. Remember, it comes straight from the sound beam. Sound doesn't bend, sound doesn't turn, sound travels straight. So our direction of beam is this way. As it interacts with a blood vessel or flowing blood, that is also going to have a direction. So in this example, we can see that the direction of flow is heading off at an angle following this line. And the angle that is created between the flow direction and the direction of the beam is theta. And we want to know this value. This is going to be very important for determining what the Doppler shift is. So remember that angles are measured in degrees. And when we think about ultrasound and what value theta can have, it really can have a value anywhere from zero degrees to 180 degrees. That is basically half a circle that the transducer can be in relation to the direction of flow. When the beam is parallel to the flow, we will see that the theta or Doppler angle 
is going to be equal to 0 degrees or 180 degrees. And you can kind of think of 180 degrees as like a negative 0 degrees. It's on the other side of the line. When flow is towards the transducer, we are seeing that 0 degree angle. And when flow is away from the transducer, but parallel, we'll see the 180 degree transducer. Transducers that are in either of these positions are going to provide the most accurate and the greatest Doppler shifts. They are also going to provide the most accurate but lowest velocity information. So when we change theta to other degrees, we are actually changing the accuracy of the measured velocity and the Doppler shift. So for example, if we are at 30 degrees or 150 degrees, the information is going to be a little less accurate. As we start to angle more, say up to 45 degrees or 135, it's even less accurate. The threshold for ultrasound in regards to inaccuracy is going to be 60 degrees. And I'll show you why in a minute here but 60 degrees or 120 degrees is the absolute threshold. We should never exceed angulation more than 60 degrees to the direction of flow. As a sonographer, you will be responsible for this angulation, keeping a 60 degree or less angle to the direction of blood flow. Now the absolute worst place that you can be in relationship to the direction of blood flow is at a 90 degree angle. No Doppler shift or velocity can be detected when we are perpendicular to the flow of blood or theta equals 90 degrees. The machine can't tell if blood is flowing towards or away from the transducer, and therefore we are not going to get any information from this angle. So again, 0 to 180 are the best ones. That means that we're parallel with the blood flow. We are either moving towards the transducer or away from the transducer, but parallel. It is okay to add angulation in, but we never want to be angled more than 60 degrees to the direction of blood flow. Never use 90 degrees. Never be perpendicular to the direction of flow. And here is why. So remember, these are all angles of theta, but the equation calls for the cosine of theta. So once we know what theta is, then the cosine of theta can be applied. Now cosine is a trigonometry function, and it's going to give us a ratio. We don't really need to get into the math of it, but you should know these values. So remember when we were talking about the absolute best angulation on the direction of flow, we said it can be 0 or 180. Those are both parallel with the direction of flow, and note that less than 90 our values are positive, over 90 degrees, our values are negative. So you can kind of think of these ones as just inverses of this side. So 0 degrees to 180 degrees, those are going to come up with a cosine value of 1 or negative 1. Those are going to be the most accurate velocities or Doppler shifts that we can detect. Now as we start to angle our transducer beam in relationship to blood flow, we start to see a different value for cosine. At 30 degrees, we're at 0 0.87. At 150 degrees, which is basically a negative 30 degrees, we see a negative 0 0.87. This is where we're going to get our directions from, a positive shift or a negative shift, towards the transducer, away from the transducer. That is why we need these large angulations to show a negative Doppler shift. But remember, this is really just 60 degrees in the other way. This is just 45 degrees with blood moving away. This is just really 30 degrees with blood moving away. So these are not truly over the 60. They are just kind of the inverse of what we're seeing on this side. So again, as we angle more, notice how cosine of theta begins to decrease. The further we get away from 1, the less accurate we are going to be. Notice then that we get down to 0 as a value of cosine of theta when theta is 90 degrees or perpendicular to the blood flow. 
So spend some time with these charts. Definitely know the cosine of zero slash negative zero or 180. Definitely know the cosine of 60 and negative 60 or 120 and the cosine value of 90 degrees because these three values are going to be very important to understanding why cosine of theta matters when figuring out velocity and Doppler shift. So let's take a look through some scenarios, just kind of discuss these numbers a little bit more in relationship to theta. So when we see a positive cosine of theta value, then we are recognizing a positive Doppler shift. When we see a negative cosine of theta value, then we are recognizing that there is a negative Doppler shift. This is how the machine knows, is it towards or away? When the cosine of theta value is one or negative one, we are getting the most accurate velocity. We are not modifying the true velocity because one multiplied by anything is itself. So we are not modifying that true velocity. So whenever you can use a zero degree angle, that is going to be the best possible, most accurate velocity or Doppler shift. Now when cosine of theta is anything other than one or negative one, we're really only reporting on a portion of the Doppler, Doppler shift being measured. So the closer to one cosine of theta is, the more accurate the information will be. However, in ultrasound, it's really hard to get a zero degree angle on the blood flow, especially when we're looking at limbs. So we've decided by ultrasound standards that the maximum we are willing to go to is 60 degrees with theta. And when we take the cosine of 60 degrees, we get 0 0.5. 0 0.5 means that we are really reporting only half of the Doppler shift value, but we are okay with that. We know that this is a reproducible number. And lastly, when theta is 90 degrees, the cosine of theta is going to have the value of zero. And this is very important that we never use 90 degrees. And that's because when we take that value of cosine theta, we end up basically with zero divided by the propagation speed if we were to plug that zero into the equation. And then zero divided by anything is still zero. So no Doppler shift can be detected. We won't be able to calculate a velocity. So never Doppler at 90 degrees to the blood flow. Lastly, then we have our variable on the denominator side of the equation, and that is C. And C, we have learned before, represents propagation speed. Propagation speed determined by the medium. Medium in ultrasound is soft tissue. So we are going to default to the propagation speed of 1540 meters per second. But as you can see in this formula, it is requiring a propagation speed being represented in centimeters per second. So we would need to take our 1540 meters per second and convert that to 154,000 centimeters per second as our propagation speed in soft tissue. Now remember that this is a constant in ultrasound, it's a constant with soft tissue. So this is the value that you would most likely use from the ultrasound perspective. But remember in the back of your mind that C is propagation speed. And if we were trying to figure out the Doppler shift in regards to a siren, then we would want the propagation speed of sound in air. So C is propagation speed. Because we are dealing with ultrasound and Doppler of blood vessels, we will use our constant soft tissue propagation speed. So now as with all of our equations that we've been learning throughout physics, we really do need to understand what the relationships are. And the formulas really allow us to see that very clearly. We just talked about propagation speed being a constant. So we really don't need to focus on how the propagation speed in soft tissue is related to the frequency of the Doppler shift, because that's going to be a constant. What we do need to focus on are how the operating frequency or transmitted frequency, velocity, and the cosine of theta are going to change the Doppler shift. Well, the good news is from this formula, we can see that all three of those are in the numerator position. So if any one of those increase, we are going to see an increase then in the Doppler shift because they are directly related. Now these relationships are going to be very important because you're gonna be asked about how variables are related to another, how they will change when one changes on your quizzes, on your tests, on your boards. You are never going to be given values of variables and then expected to complete a calculation 
based on the Doppler equation. However, you might be asked a question kind of like this. The Doppler shift with a 4 MHz transducer is 3000 Hz. If the sonographer switches to an 8 MHz transducer, what happens to the Doppler shift? This question is asking, do you understand how the operating frequency and the Doppler shift are related to one another? And knowing that frequency of the transducer is directly related to the Doppler shift because you know your formula and you know how relationships are represented, you should be able to say that the Doppler shift will either double, increase by a factor of two, or is now 6,000 hertz. And that's just going to depend on the options that you're given. There's very little math that is occurring in this question. It is truly asking, do you understand how these variables are related to one another? So I do want to show you some examples of calculating the Doppler shift using our big formula. And through looking at that math, we're just going to take a look again at how those variables are related to one another. So if you have your workbook out, you might want to pause now and just see if you can work through some of the examples, see if you can do the math before we get to it. But it is not necessary. We're going to go through each one briefly here. So our first question says, calculate the Doppler shift based on this information. We're given a transducer that is operating at 4 megahertz. The velocity of blood is 100 centimeters per second, and the Doppler angle is 60 degrees. We're going to need to take some of this information, convert it, plug the numbers into our equation, and then definitely using a calculator, because this is not expected of you to do this math, come up with our answer. So remember, our Doppler shift is going to be equal to 2. got to remember this 2. That 2 will always be there, multiplied by the operating frequency. Now, the equation that I gave you requires kilohertz. So we got to convert 4 megahertz into 4,000 kilohertz. We're going to multiply that by the velocity of blood, which was given to us in our correct unit. And then we need to multiply that by the cosine of theta. Remember, theta is the Doppler angle. So we need to take the cosine of 60. And that was one of the values I need you to remember. What's the cosine of 60? It is 0 0.5. And then we plug in our constant propagation speed because we are working in soft tissue. So 154,000 centimeters per second. If you pull out your calculator and plug in 2 times 4,000 times 100 times 0 0.5, and then divide all that by 154,000, what you'll get is 2.6. And so we are calculating the Doppler shift as being 2.6 kilohertz. Now 2.6 kilohertz is the same as 2,600 hertz. That falls into our range, that 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz that Doppler shifts typically are seen in. It is a positive value. So what we have calculated is a positive Doppler shift of 2.6 kilohertz. So I'm going to leave that initial equation down in the corner here for our examples. And what I've done is change a few of those numerator variables. So we can see what happens to Doppler shift as we change those variables. So in example two here, I have now doubled the frequency compared to example one. What do you think will happen? Well, if we double the frequency, we would expect a doubling of the Doppler shift because they are directly related. And that's exactly what happened. Again, just plugging our numbers in, we get an answer of 5.2 kilohertz. 2.6 times 2 is 5.2. So we have seen a double in the Doppler shift. You don't even have to do all of this again. If you know 8 megahertz is twice of 4 megahertz, then you should be able to multiply 2.6 by 2 to get 5.2. Number three says, now we've tripled the velocity compared to example one. What will happen? So we were at 100 centimeters per second. We've tripled to 300 centimeters per second. If velocity increases by a factor of three, then we expect the Doppler shift to increase by a factor of three. Again, you can plug your numbers in or you can just take 2.6, multiply it by 3, and we get 7.8 kilohertz. The Doppler shift has increased by a factor of 3. Our next example, now we've changed the angle to 0 degrees. What's going to happen to the Doppler shift? Now this one's a slightly a little trickier. 
because what we need to do is figure out the cosine of zero compared to the cosine of 60. And if you remember, because I told you you need to know this, cosine of theta, when theta is zero, the cosine of theta value is one. So we plug in our value of one, do the math, and we get 5.2. If you recognize that going from 0 0.5 to one is the doubling, then again, you don't need to plug in all the numbers again. It's just going to be a doubling of the Doppler shift. Because again, any of these variables on top, whatever they increase by, our Doppler shift is going to increase by. So here's another example. Now we've changed the Doppler angle to 180 degrees. So we have to figure out what the cosine of 180 degrees is and plug it in to our equation. Cosine of 180 is negative one. So now we can put in that negative one. And because we have a negative value in our cosine, we end up with a negative Doppler shift. So that is how, again, Doppler shift is going to be recognized as away or towards the transducer. And that is how we're going to get a true velocity of being away or towards. Is cosine positive or is cosine a negative value? This next one, I changed the velocity of blood to 50 centimeters per second. So this was half of what example one's was. So how is the Doppler shift going to change when we decrease the velocity of blood to half of what it was? Knowing the relationships, again, you should be able to say that the Doppler shift will be half of what it was, but we can always plug in our numbers and we can verify that. 1.3 is half of 2.6. And with our last example, I went and changed the Doppler angle to 90 degrees. Now this one isn't going to be as good to show us relationships, but it will show us what happens when we are Dopplering at a 90 degree angle. Remember the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So if we plug this in, we put zero in our cosine of theta value spot, put this in your calculator, two times 4,000 times 100 times zero, makes this whole top part the value of zero. So we basically have zero divided by 154,000, and that's going to equal zero. So there is no Doppler shift when we are at 90 degrees. Now in all of these examples, I was able to give you the velocity of blood, but that's not what the machine knows. The machine knows the Doppler shift and wants to calculate the velocity of blood. So let's take a look at what we need to do. Section 19.4, Velocity of Blood. So we learned the Doppler equation to help us bridge to being able to calculate the velocity of blood. The machine already knows what the Doppler shift is, so it's really velocity of blood that needs to be calculated. By rearranging the Doppler equation, we can now solve for the variable that the machine does not know. The values and the rules for each variable are going to be the same. So here we have our velocity equation based on the Doppler equation. We will now see that velocity is going to be equal to propagation speed multiplied by the Doppler shift. That is divided then by two multiplied by the transmitted frequency multiplied by the cosine of theta. So you need to know the velocity formula as well or know how to rearrange the Doppler equation to get to the velocity equation. Now again, you are not going to be given numbers for your variables and then expected to do this calculation. You are going to be expected to know how variables affect one another. What are the relationships? So the velocity equation makes the relationships maybe a little bit trickier. But we know that the value for C, especially in ultrasound, isn't going to change. That's still our 1540 meters per second, or for this formula, 154,000 centimeters per second. So if we look at the equation a little bit closer, what we'll end up seeing is that Doppler shift and velocity are directly related. The Doppler shift is on the numerator side of things. If it increases, velocity will increase. If Doppler shift decreases, velocity will decrease. And we already learned that from the Doppler equation relationships. So now we need to focus a little bit more on what happens when we change our operating frequency and our cosine of theta. So if we decrease 
our operating frequency, we will see an increase in velocity. And that is because these are inversely related. If we were to increase the operating frequency, we'd see a decrease in velocities. So the same is going to be true then for the value of the cosine of theta. If we decrease the value of cosine of theta, then we should see an increase in the velocities that are reported. Now again, you're not going to be asked to do the complex math, but you should know your relationships. So if we say the Doppler shift doubles, what happens to the velocity? Well, they are directly related. You should know that velocity will double. What happens to velocity when the Doppler angle changes from zero degrees to 60 degrees? Well, that is a decrease in the value of cosine. It's going from one to 0 0.5. So again, we would see an increase in the velocity reported. You need to know the formulas to understand the relationships and be able to talk about how those variables change. When we learned about the Doppler equation, we talked about that the cosine of theta is kind of a modifier on the velocity and the Doppler shift. So when we were calculating for Doppler shift, as the cosine value became further away from one or less than one, we were reporting a fraction of the Doppler shift. But now when we are looking at velocities, as we get further away from one or negative one and closer to zero, we actually start increasing the velocity that's reported. So knowing that our cosine of theta, the angle that we are Dopplering at, changes the reported velocity, we want to strive to be parallel to the beam when possible. And that is because the most accurate velocity is measured when the sound beam is parallel with flow. For the abdomen and for the heart, we are actually capable of finding windows that allow us to be parallel with flow. But it's actually very difficult to be parallel with the blood flow when we are looking at limbs or the neck. It's really nearly impossible to be at zero or 180 degrees to the flow. Therefore, we find that it is acceptable to be at 60 degrees or less when performing Doppler. Remember, 60 degrees can be negative 60 degrees, which is basically 120 degrees. So 60 degrees or less when performing Doppler is acceptable. Now we know that when we are using 60 degrees as our Doppler angle, we are creating a cosine value of 0 0.5 which means that our velocity is actually going to be twice what it really is. But we are okay with this. The ultrasound values that are used for diagnosing based off of velocities take into account that we can't always be at that zero degrees. And we know that there are limitations to the equipment and to the windows that we are using. The important part about using that 60 degrees is that the sonographer, one, does not go over it, but two, accurately tells the machine what angle they are using. And this is going to be done through a piece of Doppler instrumentation called the angle correct. Knowing then that 60 degrees is our absolute threshold for the Doppler angle, any angle above 60 degrees is too inaccurate for diagnostic ultrasound, with 90 degrees being the absolute worst. And remember that the cosine of theta also determined if the blood was flowing away or towards the transducer. And we need to know that because direction is important to the value of velocity. Otherwise, it would just be a speed if we didn't have a direction. So when the velocity is reported on our Doppler tracings, it will be displayed as either above or below a baseline. So if we take a look at this spectral tracing, this is the graph that shows us the Doppler information that is coming back from the machine, what the machine has calculated. And this is going to show velocities along the y-axis. We can see here that the units are in centimeters per second. And then above the baseline, which is zero, so above the baseline are positive Doppler shifts. And below the baseline, in this instance, are negative Doppler shifts. So we can see that the spectral tracing is showing Doppler shifts that are mostly positive with a little short section of a negative Doppler shift in relationship to blood flow and the transducer. From this graph then, the sonographer can use tools on the machine to measure the absolute highest velocity very accurately. They can measure the velocity right before the peak. They can measure how much is going below the baseline. With our 60 degree incination angle or less, we consider these velocities to be 
sufficiently accurate. So next up, I have the answers to the practice that you'll find in your workbook. The questions are asking you to identify which transducers would provide highest and lowest Doppler shifts, uh, highest and lowest velocities, and questions like that. So if it makes sense to you, please feel free to skip to the next section. Otherwise, hang around and we'll go over each question. Now, this is the diagram that you will see in your workbook, and it will ask you different questions about the transducer position and its accuracy to Doppler shift or to velocities. So the first question asks us, what transducers are going to produce the most accurate velocities? Now, when we are looking at accurate velocities, we want our sound beam to be as parallel as possible. So the most accurate velocities are going to be from transducer A and transducer B. A will have a very accurate positive velocity, where B will have a very accurate negative velocity. They are parallel with the direction of flow. The next question asks, what are going to be producing acceptably accurate velocities? So we already know that A and B are the most accurate, so those would be ideal, but we know that we can also have angulation to the direction of flow and still be acceptably accurate. So C and D are both going to provide accurate flow when considering ultrasound limitations. Remember, we do not want to increase the angle more than 60 degrees. Next, we have which transducers are going to produce negative Doppler shifts. So these are going to be any transducers in which the direction of flow is heading away from them. So that is going to be transducer B, D, and G. Next, we have which transducers are going to display positive Doppler shifts. And these are going to be the transducers in which the blood is flowing to them. So that'll be A, C, and E. Next up, we have which transducer will not provide any Doppler shift? And that is only F. F is at the 90 degrees or perpendicular to the direction of flow. Therefore, a Doppler shift will not be detected. Now, which transducer is going to provide the greatest Doppler shift? That'll actually be transducers A and B. Remember that they are parallel with the direction of flow. Therefore, their cosine of theta value is going to be 1. So we are reporting the highest possible Doppler shift when we are parallel with flow and the cosine of theta value is 1. The next question asks us then which are going to provide the smallest Doppler shift? And that's actually going to be transducer E and G. Now E and G are not providing diagnostic information but because their angulations are much higher, that means the value of cosine of theta is going to decrease. And when the cosine of theta decreases, we will see a Doppler shift decrease as well because they are directly related. Now do not confuse greatest Doppler shift and smallest Doppler shift with greatest velocity and lowest velocity because here's why. Next question asks us, where are the highest velocity is going to be reported. This is going to be transducers E and G. Because now, remember, velocity and the cosine of theta are inversely related. So when the cosine of theta decreases, as it will with E and G, the velocity that those transducers will report is going to increase. They are inversely related. The lowest velocities then are going to be found in transducers A and B. The value of cosine of theta has gone up to one, so cosine has increased. Therefore, velocity is going to decrease. A and B are going to show the lowest velocities, but they happen to also be the truest or most accurate velocities as well. The last question then is which transducer will provide no velocity information, and that is F. Again, we are 90 degrees to the blood flow, and we cannot calculate a velocity when we are 90 degrees. Section 19.5, Doppler instrumentation. Now that we've learned about the math and the actual physics behind the Doppler equation, let's take a look at how we can provide that Doppler information 
using our ultrasound machine. So modern machines allow for bidirectional Doppler detection. Remember that's that negative or positive above or below the baseline. So this means that they can recognize and display blood flow that is either moving towards or away from the transducer. And the reason that modern machines can do this is because they can use something called phase quadrature. Now this is a mathematical application and phase quadrature or quadrature detection is going to analyze the Doppler signal to determine the direction of flow as it's related to the transducer. Now in ultrasound, spectral Doppler signals can be attained through either continuous wave Doppler or through pulsed wave Doppler. These are both going to produce a graph showing velocities of the red blood cells as they pass through the ultrasound beam. Now color flow is another type of Doppler that also uses pulsed wave ultrasound. This is where colors are placed over an image to indicate direction and average velocities. Section 19.6, continuous wave Doppler. Now recall that continuous wave ultrasound beams cannot produce an anatomical image. They can, however, produce Doppler shifts, which can be graphed then into a spectral waveform. Continuous wave Doppler is most commonly used in cardiac applications and also during physiological vascular testing. In the transducer unit, we did talk about continuous wave transducers, but to review, a dedicated continuous wave transducer has to have at least two crystals, one to transmit, 100% of the time and one to receive 100% of the time. The transducer is on 100% of the time, meaning it has a duty factor of 100%. It is constantly sending and constantly receiving. The way that continuous wave transducers are created makes them very sensitive, and that is because they don't have a backing material in them. Without that backing material, they have a very high Q factor and a very narrow bandwidth. And remember, this is all true of dedicated continuous wave transducers. Now in the cardiac setting, phased array transducers are capable of creating images and then using two crystals to perform continuous wave Doppler tasks. Now remember that continuous wave transducers always need two crystals to operate. Again, one to transmit 100% of the time and one to receive 100% of the time. In this example, the sonographer is using a phased array transducer. That is how they are able to create the anatomical image, but they have turned on the continuous wave function. And now two of the crystals from the phased array are dedicated to create the continuous wave Doppler. So when a continuous wave transducer is being used, sound is emitted from one of the crystals and the other crystals listening path is going to overlap the transmitted beam. And this is going to create a very large area from which the transducer can receive echoes from. And this area is going to be called the sample volume. Now, because there is no imaging to guide a dedicated continuous wave transducer, the sonographer really must rely on anatomical knowledge and vascular analysis to interrogate the correct area. Now, once you find the area that you are interested in Dopplering, the machine will produce a graph that represents the velocities that are detected from the sample volume. So many sonographers are also going to use speakers on their machine to evaluate the flow through the sample volume because remember those Doppler shifts are audible. There are a few advantages and disadvantages to using a continuous wave transducer. These do have a little bit more clinical implication and we're going to discuss it a little bit further in unit 20. But just as a preview, the advantages of using continuous wave means that we can detect very, very, very high velocities. Because the transducer is constantly emitting sound and constantly receiving, it makes it so that the truest, highest velocities are able to be detected. And that is because there is no aliasing. And again, we'll define aliasing and do a very deep dive in it in unit 20. Now the disadvantages of the continuous wave probe is that range ambiguity. And that refers to the idea that we really don't know where we're getting Doppler information back from. Remember, it's not producing an image. We are going off of what we can hear, what we can see in our graph, and our anatomical knowledge. The other issue too then is that there's no TGC for continuous wave Dopplers. If the area that you're interrogating is very far away from the transducer, then your 
red blood cells are not providing a lot of amplitude to be displayed brighter on the screen. So we can't account for attenuation of the sound beam as it travels into the body, which can therefore change how our display looks as well. Section 19.7, pulsed wave Doppler. So recall that pulse wave ultrasound can create an image and only needs one crystal to do so. So the same is true for pulse wave Doppler. Only one crystal is needed to create a Doppler spectral tracing. And since all of our modern transducers that can produce images can also produce pulse wave Doppler, it's very common that we're going to use these multiple modes, Doppler 2D and color, in conjunction with one another during an exam. So when the machine is creating an anatomical image or the 2D image and a Doppler tracing or color Doppler is being used, we call that duplex imaging. So again, that's the 2D plus a Doppler function, color or spectral. When a machine is creating a 2D image and using both color and spectral tracing, we call that triplex imaging. Now it's very, very uncommon that you will ever just do a 2D image with Doppler tracing. We want that color information to help us guide where we place our gate from the pulse wave scan line. And just like the continuous wave transducers, we did already cover pulse wave transducers, but remember that they do need at least one crystal to operate. They are on only a small fraction of the time, meaning that they're usually listening for echoes returning. They have lower sensitivity because they have backing material. And that backing material is going to cause them to have a low Q factor and a wide bandwidth. Now, when we are using our ultrasound machine to obtain pulse wave Doppler, you will typically need to find the anatomy that you want to get the pulse wave information from. You're also going to turn on color. And the color does help to guide us where we want to place our pulse wave instrumentation. Next, then you will activate the pulse wave Doppler, usually through a knob or a button. And what will appear is a scan line over the 2D image. Remember that the array transducer only needs to dedicate one crystal to the pulse wave Doppler application. The scan line that appears represents the one crystal's scan line, so you know exactly where you are getting Doppler information from. In the middle of that scan line, are going to be two parallel lines and they kind of have a gap in between them. This is called your sample gate or sample volume. Now you can change the size of the gate. You can make it bigger or smaller. And then you're going to place that gate exactly where you want your Doppler information to come back from. Now in the gate, if there is not a third line, that means that the machine is assuming a Doppler angle of zero degrees. And this is usually going to be the case when we are imaging the heart or when you are not concerned about measuring accurate velocities. However, any time that you need to measure an accurate velocity and cannot get that zero degrees, you have to have your angle correct on. And that is what this third line is called. This is called the angle correct. Now the angle correct allows us to tell the machine what angle to use for the cosine of theta value when calculating velocity. So there's two very important things about this angle correct line. There will be a knob on your machine that you can turn and it will rotate the angle correct. You want to rotate the angle correct and steer your beam so that your angle correct is parallel with the vessel. It'll be located through the fastest part of the flow, parallel with how the flow is going. The second most important part then is that it is telling the machine what this angle is. This is theta. This is the angle that we don't want to exceed 60 degrees on. On your machine, you'll typically have a display somewhere that tells you what the Doppler angle is. So in this case, it is 60 degrees. So again, this is the angle correct. The angle correct will be placed parallel with the flow of blood. That means it's typically parallel to the walls of the vessel. The angle then is between the flow direction and the scan line. 
this angle must be less than 60. Typically what happens is that you will place your angle correct so that it is parallel or through the middle of the direction of flow, and then you can steer your scan line to become a little bit more of a cute, or you can make it a little bit more up and down, and then that is going to change the angle in between your angle correct, that's designating direction of flow, and the scan line. So there are multiple ways to make sure that we stay at that 60 degrees or less. So the really cool part about pulse wave Doppler is that the sample gate does allow us to choose exactly where we want to get that blood flow from. So if I had like a really fast jet up here, I could move the gate to this area and see what the velocities are here. So pulse wave Doppler allows me to choose exactly where I want to get information from, and that is known as range resolution. So that's a lot different from continuous wave where we can't choose the depth, we can't choose where we're getting information from, where pulse wave Doppler can. Now here are some examples of the sample volume and the, or the sample gate being placed within a vessel along with the angle correct. Taking a look at this top one here, we can see the scan line coming through the screen. The two parallel lines, the space that's between them, that's the sample gate or sample volume. And then you can see a third line through here that is the angle correct. Now the angle correct, first off, is not being placed parallel with the flow. So that's already a big no-no. We're not gonna get diagnostic information. Secondly, you probably can't see it super well, but it is at 84 degrees. So that is way too much of a difference in beam angle versus flow angle. We need that to be under 60. So this is a very, very poorly placed angle correct and way too large of a Doppler angle. In this example, we are now below 60, so we've got 16 degrees for our Doppler angle. Again, that's the angle between the angle correct and the scan line. But again, our angle correct is not accurately placed to show how the blood is flowing. So this, again, is not an accurate way to measure velocity. We have to tell the machine how the blood flow is flowing, and it will recognize then what the angle of theta is. In this example, we are finally at a correct diagnostic placement of the angle correct and the scan line. So again, we can see the angle correct here is now parallel with the flow. So we are telling the machine, this is how the blood is flowing. And then the machine can calculate what is the angle between the scan line and the direction of blood flow. It is telling me that we are at 60 degrees. That is acceptable and quite often preferable, especially for necks and limbs. So this creates a diagnostic image and diagnostic values for our velocities. Now this example is in the heart, and we are looking at our scan line coming down and our two parallel lines, that's the sample gate. Now in this example, we don't have that third line really being visible cutting across the gate, and that is because this is at a zero degree Doppler angle. Scanline is coming straight through here. We are saying that the blood flow is flowing directly at the scan line. It is parallel. It is a zero degree angle between scan line and flow of blood. And again, that is very, very common in the heart. So if you are an echo sonographer or an echo student, this is where a lot of students get kind of confused. They're like, I never have to use that angle correct. For the other parts of the body, we have to use that angle correct. We have to tell the machine which direction the blood is flowing. Technically, in heart applications, you could angle correct through here. You could say, this is how the blood is flowing. Maybe it'll be just a couple degrees off. But because of the windows cardiac applications use, we almost always just default that we're at that zero degrees. This is also probably a really good time to mention too, that you do not need to know anatomy to pass your boards. You do not need to know that this is a carotid artery. You do not need to know that this is a heart. What you do need to know is that this is a scan line. This is a sample gate. This is the angle correct. Is the angle correct less than 60? Can I find that information in the machine's display? And does it make sense for creating a diagnostic image? 
And just like continuous wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler also has some advantages and disadvantages. Again, these are a little bit more clinical in practice, so we will touch on these again in unit 20. The biggest advantage to pulse wave is that it has range resolution. Range resolution means that you can decide what depth, what area, where that Doppler information is coming from. That is awesome about pulse wave Doppler. The other great thing about it is that you can change the sample volume. Do you want to sample a very large area or do you want to sample a very small area? You can make that decision. The disadvantages of pulse wave Doppler though can be pretty detrimental to the diagnostic value of our ultrasound images. Pulse wave Doppler cannot detect high velocities. There is a limit to how high of a velocity a pulse wave transducer can detect. And that is called the Nyquist limit. And again, this is very clinical in application, so we will cover this in much more depth. But when the velocity reaches the Nyquist limit, what we end up seeing is aliasing. And aliasing essentially is just on that graph, this is the Nyquist limit here. There is clearly more to the pulse wave, more to the velocities that need to be graphed. So they kind of wrap around and get placed in the wrong area. This is considered artifact, and this causes our information to be non-diagnostic. So clinically, we need to know how to fix this, which is why we're going to cover it a little bit more in the next unit. Now, when we're using the pulse wave Doppler application on our ultrasound machine, the resulting waveform can be measured with machine calipers to accurately identify the velocities. And this is because of the fast Fourier transform. Now the fast Fourier transform is the technique used by modern ultrasound machines to understand the Doppler shift information returning to the machine and create the spectral waveform. Now we talked about that the red blood cells are going to send back different frequencies based on if they're moving away or towards the transducer. Well, there's more than just one red blood cell traveling through the gate. And so there are going to be multiple red blood cell frequencies returning back to the transducer. And the fast Fourier transform is going to be able to recognize that there are multiple frequencies coming back from multiple red blood cells. And it's going to allow the machine then to display how those individual red blood cells are traveling in regards to the transducer. So because the fast Fourier transform can analyze all this information, we end up getting really detailed information in our pulse wave spectral tracings. To talk about some terms that we've already heard, the fast Fourier transform recognizes where those red blood cells are, maps them onto the graph, and now we can determine if flow is laminar or turbulent. So in this example here, we have very laminar flow. The red blood cells are mostly moving all at the same speed or the same velocity because they're all kind of grouped together in this thin line. The red arrow here is pointing to something called the spectral window. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the clinical portion. But as those red blood cells start to travel at different speeds, we start to see kind of a widening of that line. And that's because this little red blood cell that the fast Fourier transform recognized is traveling at a slower velocity than this little red blood cell reflection up here compared to this one and this one. They're all different reflections of the speeds of the red blood cells. So the fast Fourier transform allows the machine to be able to identify all these different velocities from the individual reflections. So this is starting to probably be a little bit more disturbed flow. And in this picture down here, we're really seeing that chaotic flow. We've got flow all the way from the baseline, zero velocity, all the way up to the peak here. And we've got a lot of different flows going through here. Again, all these little speckles that are in here, all these little dots represent echoes that are coming back from individual red blood cells. And it's the fast Fourier transform that is able to detect those and map them on to the graph. So your spectral tracing is the mapping of the reflections from the red blood cells as they're translated through the fast Fourier transform. Modern machines use the fast Fourier transform. It is a computer based analysis to look at the Doppler information. Now there used to be some older versions that were analog. Remember digital versus analog. Digital is what we're using now with the fast Fourier transform. 
our analog options included a zero crossing detector, chirp Z transform, and interval histograms. So the only thing you need to know about these three terms is that the, these were the older analog ways in which spectral tracings were analyzed. Modern current machines use digital computer-based fast Fourier transform to analyze our Doppler shifts. Section 19.8, color Doppler. So color Doppler is also a pulsed wave technique, but instead of giving measurable accurate velocities, it is going to display average velocities as a 2D overlay. So the assigned colors are going to provide information about direction of flow. Now color Doppler uses pulse waves so we can choose where to get color Doppler information from. But the problem is that it is also subject to aliasing. Now since color Doppler does not provide exact measurable velocities, it is only considered kind of a semi-quantitative method of velocity measurement. And just like all of our other Dopplers, when we use color Doppler, it is best when it's at an angle, especially at zero, and 90 degrees should never be used because it cannot be calculated. But we have a little bit more wiggle room with this one. Because we are only looking at the average velocities and we're not looking to measure an exact velocity, we don't have to be as concerned about the accuracy of the Doppler angle. When the colors come up on our display, they will usually come up with a few different colors, reds, blues, some yellows, some greens. And what the machine needs to know is what color to apply to certain velocity ranges. So the machine gets the Doppler information back, calculates the average velocity, and then looks to the color map as a reference tool to match the velocities to a color. Now the map is usually displayed on the machine as a vertical bar. It is adjustable in that you can change the scale or the PRF of the color map, which color is assigned as towards or away from the transducer, and the baseline of the color map as well. The maps also come in different hues. You might see some that lean to like just reds and blues and whites, uh, where a lot of them kind of use reds, oranges, and yellows, or blues, light blues and greens. Either way though, there are two types of color maps that we commonly use. One is the velocity mode map or a variance mode map. When we are using the velocity mode maps, which is probably the more common map that is used, the velocity mode is going to show us direction and velocity, which I get is a little bit redundant because we need to have a direction in our velocity anyway. But this is a map that allows us to easily recognize what direction is being displayed for the velocity. So when we look at these color maps, whatever color is on the top of the bar is flow that is moving towards the transducer or producing a positive Doppler shift. In the middle of the map, you will see a black bar. This is the baseline of the map, and anything that shows up black is being recognized as having no Doppler shift. Now below the baseline are colors that are going to represent flow that is away from the transducer or producing a negative shift. So again, above, towards, below, away. As a sonographer, you can choose, do you want blue on top or do you want red on top? Do not be confused. Blue is not always towards, red is not always towards. You can decide as a sonographer how you want the map to be displayed. So these three components show us the direction that is being recognized with the color that's being displayed. Now the velocity part of it is seen more in these subtle differences of the color. When we have a really dark blue or a really dark red, a color that maps closer to the baseline of the center, these are going to be slow velocities. So remember our baseline is zero. So this is a five centimeter per second velocity, maybe right next to the baseline. As you move away from the baseline, note how the color changes. We're kind of moving into like a lighter blue. Some maps even go into green. Uh, with the reds, we usually go from red, orange to a bright yellow. So as we move away from the baseline, velocities, velocities that get matched to these colors are going to be higher. So again, if this is zero, this might be like a positive five, a positive 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 is the highest velocity that this map 
is going to map to. So if you see bright yellow on your screen, then you can assume that the average velocity through that area is about 60 centimeters per second. Same is true. As we go away from the baseline on the bottom side, we're getting higher velocities. They're just high velocities that are away from the transducer. Now the variance map is very similar, but the variance map is not only going to show speed and direction, but also adds in, are we experiencing laminar or turbulent flow? So in our variance mode, again, the color on top is showing towards the transducer. Colors mapped to the bottom of the color map are away from the transducer. We again have our baseline, meaning these are areas that have no Doppler shift. Now the variance map adds in the laminar and turbulent flow. So on the left of the map are colors that represent laminar flow. So think left laminar, LL, left laminar. That's true for above and below the baseline. These colors over here are laminar flow flowing towards the transducer. These colors here are laminar flow flowing away from the transducer. As the color goes across the map and starts to move towards the right side of the map, these are going to be turbulent flows. So any light blue in the map would be turbulent flow towards the transducer. This would be turbulent flow away from the transducer. You'll also see then that colors that match more towards the baseline colors are slow velocities where they get to be higher velocities away from the baseline. So with variance maps, it's not uncommon to see the colors change not only from side to side, but up and down as well. Now the variance maps are not as commonly used, but again, it is up to each individual lab and it's up to each radiologist provider or sonographer preference on which map they use. So again, no matter what map you're using, top color is always going to represent flow that is towards the transducer or the bottom color is going to represent flow away from the transducer. Again, it doesn't always have to be red towards or blue away or even vice versa. It is whatever you as a sonographer set it as. So in these examples down here, these are both velocity maps. We can see our baseline black bar here. We have darker blues transitioning into brighter whites, dark reds transitioning into bright yellows. Baseline, anything black is zero Doppler shift. Dark reds are slow velocities. Bright yellows or bright whites are high velocities. So if we look at this example here, this is the portal vein in the liver. This is our color box. Transducer is up here. Flow is red we know that it is towards the transducer. You'll also notice that there are some like little tinges of yellow in here as well. That little yellow bit through there indicates a little bit higher velocity being recorded. And also note that those are through the center of the vessel. On this side here, again, we have a velocity color map, black in the middle representing our no flow, red on the top meaning towards the transducer, blues on the bottom, meaning away from the transducer. The transducer is up here. So if we were to take a look through this red area here, we know that this is flow that is flowing up towards the transducer, which in this case is down at the bottom of the heart. So we are seeing flow from the atria to the ventricle. We can see some areas of blue here. These are representing areas that have flow moving away from the transducer. You can see a little area of black here. This indicates that there is no recognizable Doppler shift in this area, so no color has been assigned. And again, the brighter the yellow, the faster the speed. The brighter the light blue, the faster the speed, or the dark blue and the dark red indicate slower velocities. And just like pulse wave Doppler, color Doppler does need to be performed with an array transducer, because we are going to have some of those crystals dedicated to obtaining the color Doppler information. So typically we find the area that we want to interrogate, using our 2D imaging, and then we are going to activate the color by pressing a knob or button on the machine. What's going to appear then is a color box. And so the color box usually takes on the same shape as the sector. So here is the color box, and anything in this color box is going to be the area that pulse wave Doppler is going to be obtained from and then mapped to the color map. As a sonographer, you can change this color box, you can make it bigger or smaller, wider, or taller. You can also move it. If you want it to be over here, you can move it here. You can move it to the top of the screen. You can move it deeper into the screen. Now this is a curved linear transducer. So we're seeing that type of sector here. But if you're 
to be using a linear sequential transducer, remember those produce rectangular 2D images, you're going to actually have the option to steer your box as well to make it a parallelogram. So the sonographer then will move this box to wherever they are interested in, remembering to not make the box perpendicular to flow that they're trying to see. Again, we can see our color map up in the corner here with red being towards, blue being away, and our black bar in the middle. So we can see then without knowing anatomy or anything that this blue area is representing flow that's moving away from the transducer, and this red anatomy is representing flow that is moving towards the transducer. For the physics boards, you will not need to know what these vessels are if they're flowing in the normal direction. You just need to be able to match what you're seeing to the color map and how that relates to the transducer. Now to obtain the information from the color box, I had mentioned earlier that there are going to be crystals dedicated to creating the color box information. Those crystals are going to send multiple ultrasound pulses. And the multiple pulses that are sent from those crystals are known as a packet or ensemble. For most machines, you need a minimum of three pulses to create color Doppler information, but most of our machines are going to use 10 to 20 pulses per scan line to get the color Doppler information from the crystals creating the box. Now there are some benefits and drawbacks to using either a small or large packet size. So if we look at the more pulses, which means the large packet size or long ensembles, we are going to see greater accuracy in the color box. So for example, let's just say we have 10 crystals dedicated to making our color box. When we increase the size of the packets or create long ensembles, we are telling each of those crystals to send more pulses. So maybe each crystal is responsible for sending 15 pulses. When we have those more pulses, we're going to see greater accuracy. We're going to get better information back from the flow in the area. We're also going to be a lot more sensitive to slower flow in that area. The more pulses that are being used gives the machine a chance to get more information, kind of recognize those slow frequency shifts. The problem is though that whenever we are needing more pulses to get more information, that means we need more time because we can't send overlapping pulses. So large packets or long ensembles are going to require more time, which decreases our frame rate and temporal resolution. So it'll be up to you as a sonographer, you need to decide what is more important. Do I want better frame rate with less color sensitivity, or do I want more color sensitivity and accuracy, but sacrifice my frame rate to do so? Oftentimes you're just going to choose kind of a balance between the two. And quite honestly, as a sonographer using modern machines, the ensemble packet size adjustment is rarely an issue. It is not a machine tool that I change regularly. Typically, whatever the machine is set up to use is sufficient for our purposes. But again, you should know that you have the ability to use more pulses or less pulses. Those pulses are called packets or ensembles. And then if you're using a lot of pulses, they're called large packets or long ensembles, and you should know the benefits and drawbacks to using them. Recall that the pulse wave Doppler used Fast Fourier Transform to analyze the information that was coming back through the Doppler shifts and graph them. The fast Fourier transform has to be very accurate because we want to go in to that pulse wave spectral tracing and measure for exact velocities. Color, because it's only doing average velocities, does not need to be as accurate. So it uses something called autocorrelation. So autocorrelation, again, is another computer-based technique that is going to be used to analyze the color flow Doppler. So as those velocities are coming back and it has to match it to the map, that is where the autocorrelation comes in. It doesn't take a whole lot of processing or data to get to that part of it. So because of that, the speed at which color Doppler can be obtained, processed, and displayed is actually pretty quick. And we need it to be that way so we don't sacrifice our frame rate or temporal resolution more than necessary. The last concept that we're going to talk about in regards to Doppler physics and instrumentation then is power color Doppler. Now power color Doppler is a subset of color Doppler and it's also known as either energy mode or color angio. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as just power Doppler. And I've got an example here of a kidney that is using power Doppler. Notice there's still a color map here, but notice that there's no baseline. We have from really bright yellow to a darker red. Now the cool thing about power color Doppler is that its sole purpose was just to recognize 
any sort of Doppler shift. It didn't care if it was away or towards. It totally skipped that portion of the analysis. It just cared, was there any sort of Doppler shift? So it was a very simplified colorization of any motion detected by the machine. Now this kind of Doppler does have some advantages and disadvantages as well. So power color Doppler is very, very sensitive. That meant that you could show very slow flow, uh, flow in very tiny vessels, or even flow that was super deep into the body. But because it's so sensitive, it was really likely to show excessive color anytime the transducer moves or if the patient were to move. It would recognize that as motion and then show color. So you might get kind of this blooming of color around the true Doppler information. Power color Doppler is also not angle dependent. So we are not worried about keeping in with that 60 degrees or trying to get to zero. It is going to recognize motion at any degree except for 90 degrees. So any motion is able to be detected and then assigned a color to represent flow. There is no aliasing typically with color Doppler. Again, it's just looking for motion. It doesn't care if it's away below how fast, how slow. It just wants to know that there's motion and then it will assign color to it. Power color Doppler does require a lot of pulses though to be so sensitive. And because of that, it does cause a lower frame rate. And lastly, because there is no angle dependency, then it was not able to provide direction information either. So this can be considered a downfall of power color Doppler. However, newer machines more recently have been developed with power Doppler that does allow for direction. So this is definitely a newer improvement to our machines. Now, if you're wondering if your power Doppler provides direction, you can again look at your color map. Notice how this one again does not have that black bar. There's no baseline, there's no zero. So this is power Doppler with no direction. When you are using a newer machine that does have power Doppler with direction, you will see a very similar color map to like we saw before, where it does have that black bar representing the zero or the baseline. And that brings us to the end of our Doppler physics and instrumentation discussion. Now I know that was a lot of information and the next unit is going to build on this information. So before moving to the next unit, make sure that you're comfortable with what the Doppler effect is, what a Doppler shift is, and what the Doppler equation is. You should be able to recognize what each variable is, why it's important, and how it affects Doppler shift. Moving from that part of it then, you need to take a look at velocity and the velocity equation. Re-recognize those relationships that we saw from the Doppler equation now applied to velocity. And then start to put it together of how our angle to the direction of flow affects Doppler shift and how it affects velocity. Recognizing how that Doppler angle affects the Doppler and velocity information that's coming back is really going to help you with the clinical application of Doppler ultrasound. Looking more at the instrumentation side of things, make sure to recognize what continuous wave Doppler is versus pulsed wave Doppler. Recognize what the differences are between the transducers and then have a preliminary understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of continuous versus pulsed wave. Again, we're going to cover that a little bit more in unit 20. So if we can kind of have that base knowledge moving into that, the clinical application of pulse Doppler versus continuous wave Doppler will be a little bit more apparent. Lastly, then review the color Doppler information, especially on how the color map is applied to the color displayed. And then for all the instrumentation, make sure that you go back and take a look at some of those key words, phase quadrature, bidirectional Doppler, autocorrelation, packets, ensembles, angle correct, scan lines, sample gate, sample volume, all of those terms are going to be used in the clinical setting. So I wanna make sure that you understand what they are and what they apply to. So when we use them to discuss the clinical portion of it, it'll come easier. Remember that you do have your activities in the workbook that go along with the lecture, as well as the nerd check questions those open-ended questions that you can use to assess your knowledge of the information presented.